Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Darhas Patina, and I'm, I'm an ATD here at ITL, and I would like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. James Bednar. I met him about a year ago at the Scientific Python conference and saw some of the work he was doing and uh, was pretty excited. So we, he's working on a pet contract for us to do some work with environmental simulation. And I thought this was a good opportunity to have him come and share some of the other work they've been doing. And uh, he has a PhD from UT Austin in computer science and was a faculty member in informatics at, uh, in Edinburgh for 10 years. And the last several years, he's been working for Anaconda Incorporated. And he's going to tell us about making cool stuff really quickly. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Rahas. Thanks for the invitation. Sound levels OK? OK. Um, so first off, um, excuse me. Um, first off, uh, I'm wondering who is here. So, um, for instance, uh, how many people have ever programmed? Great. How many people have programmed in Python? Okay. How many people have not programmed in Python? Okay. So, uh, of the people who programmed in Python, do you ever look at it or see it? Is there? Is there somebody who never sees Python and never cares about it? Okay, I'll keep you in mind for the talk then. It's all about you. Um, okay, because this is a, because uh, I have the same material, but I can either tell the story as if it's something you're about to use or as if it's a reason to jump ship and go to the Python ecosystem instead of whatever the heck you're using now. And so I'm going to have mostly focused on these are things you could use in your own work. Um, so, um, and what I'm presenting is not a result, it's a workflow. It's a set of things together that I think could be useful, um, and hopefully we'll let you make results. Um, and so, as a background, how I, how I came to talk here today is that uh, Darhaus came to me talking about their um, existing systems for doing um, work in a geographic context, especially doing uh, simulations, um, of climate data and other uh, large gridded data sets and um, other uh, geolocated things. And you've got great software for that. A lot of it developed here, a lot of developed in collaboration with other people. Um, but it is, um, we should have slides. <laughs> it's difficult to talk about things you can't see. All right, that's better. Okay, so anyway, they're, uh, they are heavyweight um, and fairly inflexible, and that means when you need to do something new, something it didn't do yesterday, not just something you didn't do yesterday, but something it didn't do yesterday, that's, uh, that's not easy. Um, it's hard to take, if it's designed for a certain computing context, it's very difficult to transform it into something that works in a different computing context. If it's working on HPC, that's great. But then it won't really work very well outside of HPC and vice versa. Um, or if you've got it lurking on a laptop, making it work on a server with uh, multiple CPUs is not easy, and so on. Any moving between any of these scenarios is difficult. Um, whatever it does, very often people want to take a step back. OK, I'll do that, but do that for 14 values of this and three values of this. Oh, and whatever that is, do that <laughs> for three values of this, and so on. And it's very difficult to, uh, whatever system it is, if it's meant to be a certain thing, it's very difficult to step outside of it and control it in that way. And whoever created the system, they had a certain number of things they, they wanted to do, which is all great, but then you want to do something new. <laughs> you want to uh, make see things a different way. Good luck. Um, or if it's a system that was designed more than a year ago, <laughs> and you have different computers now, sometimes you'll want to, um, You'll often need to work with completely different sizes of data set that just were an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude or three orders of magnitude more than originally it was meant to do. Again, you've got to, oh, do I have to scrap this whole system? Because I can't change it very well. So instead, there's an alternative, which is don't have a big thing. Instead, have a bunch of tiny little things, each one of them um, well done, each one of them with somebody, uh, each one of them has a champion. Oh, this is my thing. And there's another thing that's owned by someone else and owned by someone else. And then you, uh, the, the reason Python is important, th that could be true in any language, but the reason it matters that it's Python 
is that Python lets everything be stitched together very easily. And so that's all great. That's an alternative to a big monolithic system. But then instead, instead of a monolithic system, you sit down and you get your job done. With scientific Python, usually you sit down and you do a lot of work. <laughs> and you do a lot of programming and you put it all together and eventually you get your job done. And so that's, um, that's not very good, and especially because the result of doing, the more work you do there, the more artifacts you have, the more code you have developed that you now have to maintain or throw away. <laughs> it's, uh, it's now you've, instead of working hard and gotten away from future work, now you've created future work for yourself. Opportunities, yes, but also future work. So uh, I'm here to tell you a different way to do things. And it's not an easy, it, was, it's, it hasn't been easy to work out, but I think it is easy to use. So let, let's see about the alternative here. And you're going to be quizzed on this. You've got to memorize all of these libraries. Um, most of these libraries come from people who currently work at Continuum, now called Anaconda, uh, but not all of them. Um, these libraries are mostly, they're all maintained by different people. Well, I, I maintain the there are four of them. I manage people who maintain four of them. And others are managed by other people in Continuum, and others are managed outside. But we make them all work well together. Everyone involved knows everyone else. And everyone uh, is able, when they find a problem with one library, to go to that person, talk to them as a human being, and figure out how to make things work. Um, and so uh, together, these libraries do a lot of the things that um, are not about whatever it is your particular domain area of expertise is. They do everything else. Whatever you're strong at, great. You do that. This is going to handle all the infrastructure around it in terms of shuffling data back and forth and getting it onto your screen so you can make a decision about something, which is hopefully something you know about. So there'll be uh, steps in the middle that we assume somebody else in this building will do. Uh, these libraries together add up to a workflow that basically goes from data to something that human eyeballs can look at and mess with. So, and I'll come back to each one of these uh, as they come up in the talk. So how many people in the audience have heard of one of these libraries? Two? Three? Four? All right, you guys, you guys are in business. Um, okay, so here's... Um, Here's a sample task, and I um, and this focus is this is presented as a data science task. You can you can you can come at it a different way. Here I'm starting with a data set, and I'm going to say how do I get from that data set to my eyeballs. Um, but you can also, uh, in a simulation context, often you're the one generating the data, so you start to step back where you're um, uh, dialing up the um, the parameters for the simulation that creates the data. It, this. Workflow works for either one, but I have to choose one, and, I'm, and it's a little easier if I focus on the data science uh, story. So in that story, you start with some data. You've got a chunk of data, and you're ready to do something with it. Um, first off, you have to get it on the screen, um, which involves a lot of steps. And then you need to, um, almost certainly, your data has more than a dimension or two, in which case it all won't all fit on your screen. You're going to have some other things that might be important for the data. You need to choose between to select or to adjust. So you almost certainly you're going to need some widgets to be able to, to explore those spaces. Um, just because you don't have a 50-dimensional screen, you've only got a two-dimensional screen. And you often have 50-dimensional problems. And then once you've got that, you want to share it. You want to give it to somebody down the hall, somebody around the corner, somebody at a different site. You need to have it leave your hands, leave your own programming environment. It needs to be something other people can consume. So basically, it's st it, and the idea is to go from data to decision, as I usually say. At some point, it becomes something people can interact with, and they interact with it, they make a decision, and then value is achieved. You've achieved something from having doing all of this work, right? You've got to start from the beginning and add up. So let's do that, and I'll do it during the talk. Um, uh, this is a Python notebook, anyway, by the way, that I'm running here. So um, I am in Python at the moment. Um, so uh, if you were to do that in Python, um, the way it would normally work is you'd get some prototype running. Often you'd start with the Jupyter Notebook. I guess I didn't ask that. How many people use Jupyter Notebook? So we're not complete convergence across Python. Um, so you... Uh, 
whenever you have a new type of visualization you want to see, you would probably work on it a while and build up some set of code that creates that visualization. Um, then you add some widgets, then you get something. And by the time you're done, you've got this, this thing in front of you. You can see it, but you can also see this code. And you can see the mapping between that code and this thing you're using. And it's kind of a mess. Um, as soon as you want to do anything with it, it you, if you did it in a notebook, you, if you want to deploy it, you're going to have to do something else. Um, if you want to start over and visualize different aspects of it, completely different things, you're pretty much going to start over. If you want to do something that didn't just sort of fit in your easy laptop solution, you're probably going to start over. So this is all bad. Um, so here we'll say that how to do it instead. Um, you don't need to study this list. Um, but basically, we're going to go through, start with some data, get a plot immediately, as quickly as humanly possible, get a plot on the screen so you can start dealing with things visually. Um, and then understand what it is you might want to vary about that, what you're seeing, and then uh, deploy, basically. So uh, I will bore certain segments of the community by looking at a, a boring data set, but uh, it's very easy to talk about. It's tangible. Um, it's uh, about 10 million points of just GPS locations of New York City taxis. Um, and we will. Uh, we'll be using uh, this instant. We'll start out by using Parquet, Dask, and Numba, um, which is all done in the same line. Um, so what, what's happening here is uh, actually I, there's a notebook. If I hit the uh, imports list, but there's an import list that explains that DD is Dask data frame, and uh, so ba basically the Dask system allows you to read things in this file, uh, the Parquet format. The Parquet format is very nice for this type of data which is columnar data that could be in a spreadsheet. Um, it, you can also load X-array data if you have uh, gridded data sets, almost the same way here. Um, so let's say you've, you've loaded it. It loads it into a Dask data frame. And by default, that Dask data frame is all running on this one laptop right here. But it could be distributed across processors. And none of the downstream code would care or know about it. So Dask will handle uh, basically distributing uh, chunks of uh, data and the computation that goes associ that's associated with them in a way that none of the anything else you'll see cares about. So right now it's all running on the laptop, but it doesn't have to. Um, okay, so we loaded some data, and this is what it looks like. It's a, a bunch of columns and a bunch of values in them. It's data. Um, so, but it's it's ten, approximately yeah, about eleven million points of data. Um, and so you have to use a picture because you can't look at 11 million points and make any sense of it. Um, but let's say we don't want to start a software project and we don't want to use a monolithic system. So what are we going to do? Uh, we'll use Holoview. So um, Holoview is something that my group originally developed at the University of Edinburgh when I was a faculty member, not at uh, Anaconda. And it was because we were doing science, uh, brain science, actually, um, and needed to deal with a lot of large data sets and, and uh, iteratively look at them. Um, and the way that, and we're doing simulations of, of brain data, and so we generated a lot of things, and we knew where it was going to come from, but we didn't want to do work every time we looked at something. Uh, so we set up this way that things actually just uh, are visible themselves. So we use Holoviews, and then we also want to be able to interact with it. So Holoviews has to be married with something. It's either married with Matplotlib, or with Bokeh, or with Plotly, and we want um, we want full interactivity. So we're using um, Bokeh which means that we just type here. We just say Holoviews. We imported Holoviews as HB, and now we did hb.extension bokeh. And th these little pretty pictures mean that you've got Holoviews backed by bokeh. Um, OK, now remember, we, are, we had our points here. Um, uh, here. So we, um, we created something called uh, DF. That's the data frame that we're storing our data in. And now let's uh, visualize it. So here's the code take that it takes to visualize that data. Um, you pass, basically, we have some columns. And we want to say which columns we care about and what they sort of mean. And what we're saying here is that we're going to care about the uh, pickup locations of this of these taxi data, this taxi data, and um, that those are going to be two numbers. OK, two, two scalar numbers. And alone, just knowing that isn't enough to plot anything. But if we further say that those are points on a two, in a 2D space, 
then it can immediately plot, be plotted. You don't need any other information other than knowing that you have a bunch of x-coordinates and a bunch of y-coordinates. That's sufficient to make a plot. Um, uh, in this case, it, it would be a plot with uh, 10 million points in it, and if I did not include the word decimate here, that would crash my browser, because I'm running Chrome here, and Chrome can handle 100,000 points. It cannot handle a million or 10 million. Uh, so I put this little thing here to hide, the, to just take the top thousand of them, thereby throwing away nearly all of my data. But I did get a plot. Uh, it is Manhattan. You can see Central, Central Park over there. It's a pretty ugly plot, though. Um, so let's, let's do something about that. We need, we need a different plot. This is not a good plot. Um, so... Um, Uh, but it's not, it's not pretty, so let's, uh, let's uh, customize it a little bit. So here we have the, uh, the same, it, it, these are two more lines added to the same line you had before. Again, it's doing decimate points, so again, it's throwing away nearly all the data, but it's a bigger plot, and it doesn't have any um, axes on it, and it's, um, so I, all I did is tell it I want some options and so on. Okay, so now I got a plot that's a little better. Still throwing away all my data, though, and I don't like that, so... Um, instead of typing uh, decimate, I bring in a new library called Data Shader. And Data Shader will do something entirely different from decimating. Um, so here, uh, Data Shade accepts the same object. The objects were just declared as points, so Data Shade can tell that they're points. And um, I'm feeding in the same options, so it's big and has a black background and all that. Um, but data shade will take all of the points and rasterize them into a fixed sized array. Um, and uh, thereby make use of every single bit of the data. And so basically, you've got a set of pixels there. Associated with each pixel is a bin. And every taxi trip landed in one of those bins. And it accumulated by bin and then maps those into a color. And uh, the result is that now we have a. Um, a, uh, a live um, way to look at the data that is always um, practical in a browser. So there's 10 million points, but those 10 million points are never sent to the browser. If you watch, as I zoom in, it's briefly an image, and then it becomes a re-rendered image at my new resolution. That makes sense? So I can get down to every in individual little point, all the points that there are, whatever, whatever there is, as far down as it goes, I have both the ability to, to access all of the points and also not crash my browser, <laughs> and also see all the points at once because they're combined in a mathematically and perceptually rigorous way. I was actually studying the visual system um, in my brain science um, so that it adds up to be as if you had an infinite resolution display that you are some distance away from. So everything is, when you're seeing this view, it's as if um, every pixel there were an average of all the, uh, all the infinite numbers of in pixels that are within that pixel. Hopefully that makes sense. Anyways, it's defined in a way that it acts as if there's um, all the resolution that you could ever need, and you just have to go and look, and you'll see the, the data. In. And you can see weird patterns in it. Those are all real patterns. The, um, it really is granular in that way. All on the fly. Um, we had a version, when we first started, we assumed we would need to do it with tiling, and we set all that up, and it was, and we realized that our, the time we were taking to do all that tiling was actually dominating everything. Um, and I don't know if I, I still have it running, but I have a version that has a billion points will, will work live on a laptop in a second or so. So whenever you zoom in, it takes a second to get the new one uh, for a billion points. And beyond that, you'd probably want to use either tiling or distribution. But, it, but we actually had way more infrastructure than we just deleted it all and said, hey, this is actually fast enough. It's, so it's completely alive, and it's also completely stupid because it's, um, even though um, this data set goes to here, and if I zoom into here and then zoom in again, it's going to go through the um, entire data set again. Here, if I zoom in one little bit, it goes through all 10 million points again. There is no spatial partitioning whatsoever. So um, it's not making use of all sorts of things we could do to speed it up. It, what's making it fast is Numba. Numba combined, so Dask is 
speeding out process, uh, um, speeding out tasks to the four cores. Uh, I guess there are four cores on this. There are eight hyper-threaded four regular real cores on this machine. Um, so it's dividing things by core. On each core, it's running code that was originally Python, but has been uh, just in time byte compiled down to machine code to run on each of the four cores. And the process of going through that is just it's, it's doing something really dumb. It's just going through all of the data and accumulating it, and it just needs to make a pass through the data to do that. And it's able to do that very quickly. And uh, so Python doesn't get in your way because not, it quickly just drops down to machine code for that. So, um, and this uh, right here, this is points. You can do um, uh, lines. When you're doing uh, gridded data, it's effectively re-gridding re or re-rasterization. No matter what you give to it, DataShader will raster it. We'll rasterize it, sorry. OK, so um, immediately with Node, I mean, I just had to type the word data shade instead of um, uh, decimate. When I put X sampling, that just determines what happens when I zoom in really far. So if I take that out, um, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, if I zoom in very far, eventually the points become too hard to see. So that defines, basically, the, that parameter just gives me a minimum size that if I zoom in enough, it's never going to zoom in any further. Uh, at the moment, if you zoom in enough, I don't know, you can't, you probably can't see anything on there. So anyway, that's totally not a required parameter. Data Shader doesn't need any parameters. It is totally just calculating the shape of your data. There are things you can change about it, but it doesn't need it just to reveal what it is. All right, well, so this is um, obviously geolocated data but is not being shown in uh, geographic coordinates. So uh, let's, let's do that. Um, so here's the same code from a second ago. Um, now I want to put some map tiles underneath it. So with Holoviews, um, Holoviews defines um, this operator star here uh, that basically um, overlays. And it's got another useful operator plus. I don't know what that's. That is going to look like. <laughs> uh, yeah, so plus will lay things out side by side, um, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't know what coordinates you want here. So it's there's no data at at one meter resolution. Um, but um, that's a digression. Uh, anyway, what it is so basically what we're able to do with uh, Holoviews is very easily lay things out, overlay them, have stacks put annotations on top of things, put histogram on the side, put an extra little inset. Any of that is, is super easy to do. Um, it was designed to be. Uh, tiles are provided by the companion library called uh, GeoViews. So GB is uh, abbreviation for GeoViews. And here it just means that if you've got a URL for any um, uh, server that can serve tiles, it'll overlay it. OK. so. We've gone from data to getting a plot. It's, um, if we can do whatever we like here. We can make this plot more and more uh, customized. Um, uh, do whatever we like. But let's just assume you're going to make some, this is some visualization that you could use to make some sort of decision. Let's say you've got, you're happy with that. Whatever it is, you can use the facilities to do that. OK, now you need to go further. Um, just to uh, summarize, here's the code. Unfortunately, I don't know why it's doing this. But uh, this is the code that we've executed so far, including all of the imports. So you import some stuff. You, uh, you load Holoviews and tell, you, tell Holoviews that you want to use the Bokeh front end to it. You read a file. You decide how you want your thing to look. You uh, de declare that you want to look at this bit of the data frame, not any other columns, just these bits. And you're going to view it as points on a 2D plane. Um, you're going to data shade it so you don't crash your browser, and you're going to um, uh, get a, use a tile source, and then you're going to put the tile source and overlay the tips. That's all there is to it. You can get a fully interactive thing, distributed, just in time compiled, handling big data, handling small data, whatever it is. Those things are all just done in the background. Those are done for you. Um, but uh, the next steps are about things that you want to do yourself. So um, often at this point, you've got something you want to pull somebody over and you want to show them. You want to share something at the, right at this point. As soon as you have something that looks pretty to you, that looks like something you might want to use. Um, 
So you want to define some variables or some parameters that somebody so somebody could mess with. Um, they can already zoom in, but you want to you want to say parameterized by hour or something like that. I don't. Know. Um, so uh, let's declare some uh, parameters that um, that people can use. In this case. Um, Maybe they don't want to see the background map, or maybe they do, or maybe they want a dark background map. So let's give them a knob. Uh, we need, people need to be able to choose between full strength colored map or no map at all, or anywhere in between. So we'll give, we'll give them an alpha parameter for that, it varies from zero to one. Um, we will let them choose between, um, these are all, this is a small number of parameters, but each one is trying to illustrate something completely different. The first one is let them choose something about the plot. Uh, confusingly, the second one says plot, but it's, uh, it's about choosing what you want to plot. <laughs> uh, the first one is just about the visualization, alpha, but this one is about do you want to plot uh, pickups or drop-offs? And those are going to be different columns in your data frame. And so you're deciding uh, what it is that you're going to visualize. Not The first one is how to visualize it. The second one is what to visualize. Um, the third one is another type of um, uh, how to visualize it, what color map do you want to use. And then let's say you want to do some filtering. You want to have not just the entire data set. So you're filtering by column, basically, in the, set, in the plot parameter. And then let's filter by row. Uh, which um, trips do we want to have? Well, the ones that have a certain number of passengers in some range. So these are a lot of the types of things you want to do with a data set to decide what it is you're going to see at any time. And um, but. What we've done here, actually, um, we declare these. Uh, this this is um, declared as parameters using the param library. The param library allows you to declare your parameters without saying any word about widgets. There's no dependency on any graphical toolkit at this point. It doesn't require you to know that you want to display things as IPy widgets or that you might want to display it as JavaScript widgets in a leaflet app, whatever it is. Um, you don't declare it at this point. You only declare what it is about your own domain that you care about. You care about passengers. You don't care about um, particular GUI libraries. And so it allows you to capture that. And, that's, uh, and you can capture that wherever it appears in your hierarchy of your system. If, if you've got some object, you can label it right there with the parameters. You don't have to think about whether that object is going to be part of a GUI app or part of a massive supercomputer run. That, that's irrelevant at this point. You just need to capture what your domain is like. And then you can uh, use it. So we can use those in ways that have nothing to do with widgets. Like in this case, um, let's just look at the value for alpha. Well, it's a Python attribute. It, parameters are just Python attributes. They're totally s straightforward. If you change them, then they are different. This is a class. This is changing it at the class level. So this is a Python class. So any object of that type will now have um, an alpha of 0.5. Uh, if you try to set it to something that is not allowed, you'll get an error. So it allows you to declare not only that it is something you can vary, but uh, how it can be varied. You can put ranges on it and things like that. Um, you can create an instance of that class, and then you can change it at the class le at the instance level. So you can define the standard way things are done, and then how they're specifically done. Um, changing it at the instance level doesn't affect the class. That's straightforward. Um, but once you've done that, it just turns out that the information that you declared here is sufficient to be able to create widgets. Now, this wasn't about widgets. We we're talking about the documentation string, the default value, the, uh, the range, um, the allowed values. Like this, val this parameter can be one of these two values. But as soon as you've declared that, what the allowed values are, well, you can get a widget for free. So. Um, that's a very good question. So IPy widgets are built on traitlets. Um, the param library is very similar to traitlets. It's, um, it predates traitlets by about six years. <laughs> um, and it could, in principle, be merged with traitlets. I haven't seen any interest from the traitlets community on that. Um, traitlets um, tend to be used as uh, the underlying basis for IPy widgets. But in practice, uh, most people I've ever seen use IPy widgets directly rather than as traitlets. And um, 
if you do, I, my first recommendation is if you want to use iPywood, just to use traitlets and then slap your iPywood just on top, building on what you've declared as a trait level. But there's no actual documentation on how to do that. It is possible. I've, I've seen it done. It's not apparently recommended by them, but it would be recommended by me. So, yeah, we have a difference of opinion on how to do things, but underneath it all, traitlets and param are very similar. <coughs> traitlets have only the one outlet, which is iPywidgets. Param has an iPywidgets outlet or a um, uh, Bokeh widgets outlet or a, um, uh, even a TK outlet, which was the original one from 10 years ago. So it's meant to be, in fact, that's another good point here, that which is that I've seen many widget libraries come and go. Param has, I, I dug out my old library from uh, 2004, it was all based on Param, and I plugged on, plugged these widgets on top of it, whoa, it works. And we didn't have to even change the old code, let alone um, um, do much work. So uh, anyway, it's meant to abstract the idea of what it is describing about your domain from what your widgets look like. Those are two totally separate uh, concepts. So here are the widgets you'll get by default for this. You can use that information however you like. Here, this, we provide this sort of macro, this, this quick and easy way to just dump all the widgets on the screen. Um, and you can do it in little chunks like that. You might have a chunk of widgets here from one object, another chunk from another object, and use that, you can use that to compose the visualization. Uh, the simplest thing is just to have a, a dump of your widget. Um, and in this case, okay, well now we, um, we can change our various parameters or whatever. Um, uh, choose whatever we like. Um, uh, but, but they're not hooked up to anything. So these are just, the, the values are there and they will change in that object, but the object is not affecting anything. If you just look at the original definition, all it has in it is the uh, parameters. So we need to add something else now. Um, we need to link the plot that we created um, to these parameters. And there are a lot of ways to do that, but one obvious way is if those were declared in a class, then you can make a method that reads the values from the class. And so if it's alpha, you just, it'll just be read as self.alpha. It's just parameters just, and traitlets both are just normal Python attributes. Um, so, okay, now we've de declared these are the things we want our users to mess with, and here's the same code as you saw before, but now we do sneak in a little bit of changes, like we're able to change the alpha based on whatever the value of that is. So it doesn't care how you set that value, it just cares what the value is, and so on. And eventually returns the same thing as, as we saw a minute ago. Um, and you can, uh, you can see how it works, is if you make an object and you modify one of those parameter values, um, and then you call this make you, whether or not you modified anything, you'll see that it's a, um, you get the result. Actually, you can't tell, but there is a very dim map in there with alpha 0.2. I can see it on my screen, but I guess we can make it be a, a higher alpha. Okay, now you can see it. So um, basically, you can mess with those parameters by hand if you want, but why would you do that? Well, you might want to do that because you might want to run a whole bunch of code, uh, the, the same code 100 different times. So because it's not tied to any widgets at this point, you can just do what you like with it. You can parameterize this. Uh, you can do a parameter sweep over this, no problem. In this case, it wouldn't make any sense because it's just plotting a, you, well, I guess you could. You could plot it and render the pictures, get a disk full of PNGs if you wanted to. That might be a good way to use it. But what I said we were going to do is widgets, so let's go ahead and just do widgets. So um, for widgets, you need to marry the widgets to, you need to make Holoviews aware of the widgets. And you do that by telling the, you tell Holoviews uh, that you're, um, that there's a method called make view, which is the method from a minute ago. Uh, you basically, you register that method with Holoviews and said, um, I'm gonna plot something and whatever it is, it's gonna come back from this method. So I don't know what's gonna come back, but whatever it is, it's gonna come back from that method. So when I need to show something, like I do when I'm asked to render a plot here, um, it's gonna come back from that method. So now um, you, can, um, uh, have a, you can have the parameters, you can have the associated plot, um, and uh, you've got something that, in, at least in your, um, in your browser, is a, is a unit of things that can be changed um, about something you care about. 
All right. So far, so good. We were able to get a plot pretty quickly. It handled big data pretty quickly. It runs quickly. I can quickly get some parameters associated with it. I can combine those together. Um, and now I want to share it. I don't know. Let's make sure it's actually running. Uh, color map. Um, uh, that maybe as a good aside here, um, uh, notice that this is, I haven't told it anything special. It doesn't know that some of these parameters are about the plot and some are about the uh, underlying data. So whenever I drag this here, um, it's going to data shade everything. So when I drag the alpha, it's going to go through 10 million points to get my new picture, even though um, the new picture doesn't chain doesn't depend on the data at all. <laughs> it depends on the color map, which is the last stage after the data. And so that can actually, in fact, this is the color map of the map tile. <laughs> so uh, this is the default basic way. And you can make it, uh, we, are, we have prototypes where we have to really settle on a syntax we like, which has been a problem, um, for declaring in the original declaration that alpha, that uh, basically instead of having one method, you break it into three and you declare that alpha depends on, uh, th this method depends on alpha, the other methods depend on the other parameters. So since you've got them all declared there, it's very easy to refer to them by name, and so you can break up this computation. So uh, at the moment, um, there is no breaking of it. It's all doing um, the simplest thing, which you, you can get in one line of code. It'll take a little more effort to do, to do other things. Right. Make sense? Okay, now you want to deploy. Having your colleague came by and had a question about it, and you talked to him, but now you want to share it to somebody who's not next door. Um, so what you do is you take that code that you just wrote in a notebook, um, and you do several of three or four possible things. One is you can point them to your running Jupyter uh, um, notebook. That's one thing you might do to a very technical colleague, so I don't do that here. Um, another is you could convert your entire um, notebook uh, to a Python file. Uh, we have a little conversion script that'll take the Jupyter notebook and put it a, make it into a standalone file that doesn't depend on Jupyter. Um, and you can do the, uh, call bokeh serve on that. Um, in this case, we'll just, um, you can also just cut, cut and paste the code, because none of the code actually depends on the notebook. And uh, then call uh, bokeh serve. There's a little bit of annoying boilerplate that you have to add at the end. Um, I don't know if you can even see here. There's, there's like two lines at the very end. This is the whole, uh, the whole set of code um, that we saved to a separate file. Um, so now this is all the code you saw before, um, plus the class uh, that you saw before. And then I'll probably have to shrink this down so you can see it. Okay, uh, so we have, uh, we have a little bit of code which effectively all it does is tell the Bokeh server what you wanted to render out of everything. There are a bunch of Holoviews objects in this slide deck, um, and you, if you were to tell it to serve that, it wouldn't know what to serve. You have to basically anoint one as the thing to serve, or one layout of them. It can be a complicated combination of things, but whatever it is, you have to say this is the thing uh, to serve, and, um, and that's what we do here. Um, we say that dmap, in this case, is the thing to serve, which was this dynamic map that we were looking at earlier. Um, a dynamic map is just a way to handle data that you don't necessarily know the shape of beforehand. So that was, that was what we were looking at a minute ago. Um, and we're here we are telling, um, uh, we were basically getting a handle to that and then passing it in to the um, um, widget object, which knows how to deal with the bokeh server. And then it's running somewhere. Let me see. Um, that's not it. This one. So here's the result of bokeh serve on that on that same set of code. Um, it's I don't know if it's still running. It, I launched it a long time ago. <laughs> um, and then there's a just as another example. There was um, what was that here? Uh, so this was a, a very similar type uh, of 
data set is just a bunch of OpenStreetMap data points, but in this case, there's a billion of them. Uh, you can do it the same way. I mean, it's, uh, I really don't know if that's still running. Um, if it was, it was almost certainly swapped out to disk. So um, you can see well, the map files are updating anyway. It'll take a while uh, the first time. I think I, I showed this to some of you yesterday. Um, uh, but then after that. Uh, come back to that to see if it has woken up. It basically has to page. Uh, the data set takes my entire notebook's memory, so it has to page all of that in before it can do this calculation. But at once it's in memory, it'll be, it's very fast. And where were you? Let's check over here. All right, so here you can actually um, see that that um, that I've been in uh, the Jupyter notebook for all of this. Um, let's see what I think there was one more slide though. Um, there we go. All right. Um, I'll ignore all that. Uh, okay. Um, one. Um, what I showed you was Bokeh Server. Um, the reason I showed you is that Bokeh Server works well. Uh, there's also a uh, project called Jupyter Dashboard Server. What that's promising you is something I would very much like to have, but you can't have it today, <laughs> which is Jupyter Dashboard Server lets you take the notebook, lets you graphically select some of the cells and say, these are the anointed cells. And you drag them to a display and you lay them out and say, this is my dashboard. And then you launch that as a separate, um, um, separately running thing that doesn't require your original notebook. Um, it's a great idea for a project, but unfortunately it is a dead project. <laughs> it has been shelved and is not, you can download it, you can run it, and you can, you can do that. So it's a great way if you want to try things out but it has no future at the moment. There's no one who's maintaining it, and there's, it doesn't work. With, you have to make sure to put, pin things to a lot of old versions, and uh, you get all sorts of errors. I'd, I don't recommend it, but it's a great idea. I think that we're going to get to that. Um, right now, what we have is Bokeh Server, which is very mature, very well supported, but does not have this drag-and-drop layout that I'd love to have, um, just to quickly get something to share. What Bokeh Server will do, though, it will serve things that um, if you really care a lot about the layout and you really want to build an app, you can make a customized HTML template to do whatever the, it is that you want. And the, the Bokeh Plus will show up at the right spots in there. Um, and so Bokeh Server can give you complete control. It doesn't give you complete um, ease of use like Jupyter Dashboard, Dashboard Server should. Um, also, the, uh, the Param library involved is very old. I think it's the first library that we did that's still in current use. Um, uh, param, but all of the different things that come on top of it, uh, we only make those as nice as they need to be because we know that they're going to go away. <laughs> there will be a new toolkit. Um, at the moment, uh, I'm about to abandon ParamMB. ParamMB basically is the marriage of Param and IPy widgets. IPy widgets are great sometimes, and often they are not great. And there, it has all sorts of uh, errors on JavaScript console, also errors in your notebook that you'll have, incompatibilities, and it's driving us crazy. So we're only going to use Bokeh, Param Bokeh for the moment, um, which uses uh, all the same declarations. You just change the word Bokeh to NB when you're um, importing it. Um, but anyway, it, it is not. Uh, it's the least polished of any of the solutions you'll see here. Data Shader is very solid. It does what it does super fast, and it's going to keep doing that. Um, Dask does what it does super well. Numba does what it does super well. Um, uh, Holoviews is very uh, solid and uh, mature and covers a lot of ground. It's all built on Bokeh, which is also very solid and mature. Um, the widget stuff is the stuff that we're trying to actively work on right now to make Putting all this together, adding widgets and adding dashboard and building in a dashboard, that part is what we're focusing on as the weak link right now. And so there's a lot of churn there. There's a lot of uh, edits to those files this morning. There will be tomorrow and so on. So that's the part where it's more bleeding edge. The other components of this workflow that I've showed you are all quite uh, mature and usable. So. 
anyway, I guess that's all I have uh, at the moment, which is to uh, just say that you can go from data to a dashboard, a widget each kind of thing where you've laid things out um, and you've been able to share them with people. And it really is, that was, it's 30 lines uh, of code to do the full thing. Um, it's, uh, it's very flexible. So it's a way to, uh, instead of having it, and, and it's meant not to be a software development project. It's meant to be, I've got some data, and I, and I need to make it come out. Or I've got some uh, simulator, I'm going to have some parameters, and I will get some data out of it. And then it's basically the same workflow as here. So. Oh. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, it looks like it woke up. It might have gone to sleep again now, but uh, <laughs> so basically, it'll um, the max uh, memory management is very aggressive at uh, swapping things out. So um, okay, so at the moment, this is the this is the one billion point uh, data set, and like I said before, no matter how much I've zoomed in, if I want to zoom in a little more, it's processing all billion points again, which is utterly stupid. But it's it is what it is because it's a uh, it's a data frame, basically, and it doesn't have any idea what order it's in. It doesn't have, make any assumption that it's even sorted in any way. And it's a, a data frame of the 1D structure. These things have 2D locations, so it's actually fairly difficult to decide how you're going to sort it. And so we need a, a data structure that's um, arranged in 2D. But as soon as you have that, then you basically can have enormous amounts of data and not care about any of it except what you're looking at. At the moment, though, luckily, it's fast enough that um, at least if you don't want to run a lot of other things at the same time, um, you can do a billion points interactively, and you don't hate life. So, and, it, and it's got all the points there. They're all, if you zoom in, eventually you get down to every individual GPS coordinate that was ever passed through the system. And you can't see them, so then there's a button you can drag to make them visible. Well, you can serve things, and then you can iframe them into other things. That's, that's the cheap and easy answer. Uh, otherwise, you have to be more specific about what you want to embed it in. Um, there's not a lot that's specific. To, so you don't even have to use Bokeh Server for this uh, if you don't want to deal with large data, because you can just put all of the data in your web page. Basically, Bokeh will turn Python into static JavaScript and HTML very happily. And Holoviews will, will let you do that, no problem. It's just that all of your data is now going to your browser, and that better be OK. If it's not, you're going to have to be backed by a server. And if you're backed by a server, you need communication channels between the Python and JavaScript. Bokeh Server is one place we have those communication channels. Jupyter Notebook is another place we have them. We were just talking about, can we set them up in Django? Yes, yes. You just need some bidirectional communication channel. And if you have that, then the rest is all, is all easy. So it uh, depends on the context, but surely yes. May, uh, how hard is it? Uh, it depends exactly what it is. If you have anything that you can make it look like a data frame or an X-array, uh, multi-dimensional data set, as long as it, so um, if you want to have, uh, uh, well, basically, uh, if you use Data Shader, uh, HoloViews can use any, any sort of data. It doesn't really matter. But if you want to be able to make use of Data Shader, Data Shader understands data frames, and it understands um, X-Array. So it, whatever it is, if it can be made to view as one of those things. Uh, so for data frames, it has two supported kinds, uh, Pandas Data Frame and Dask Data Frame. And Pandas code is 30 lines. Uh, DAS code is 100 and some odd lines. So adding a new type of data frame where you have an abstraction over distributed data, uh, if it's a sane system, should be a relatively small um, addition to that. So it, and, it's, and it's designed in a, using something called multi-dispatch, which lets you add in new backends to it without changing the code that we ship. So there, there could be people who right now are having other backends and we need not know about it. But that, that is a programming exercise. This is meant to be put it together nicely for data science. Doing, uh, building a backend like that is definitely, you're going to need a real programmer. Yeah. 
it, it would be a great example to, for somebody to set up. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Bokeh Server uh, has a nice setup with uh, Nginx um, to do that um, replication. Um, I don't. I don't know the details myself. I haven't tried it, but um, uh, people have deployed Bokeh Server to certain numbers of simultaneous users using the Nginx, and they said it was fine. I really haven't followed up on how how fine it was. <laughs> Well, certainly manually, this is running on port 5000. It could be you can start up as many listening on as many ports as you want, and I think that's basically. I, I totally don't understand Nginx, but I assume it's something like that that it will uh, spawn multiple ones. Um, and um, yeah, and you can spawn these on multiple machines and whatever you feel like. Uh, but it but it is a good point that this is um, this is not immediately set up to make it easy to serve things to the American public. So if you wanted people to be able to use this data set like this to explore Hurricane Irma or whatever, this is it's going to take work. You have to marry this with some other system that can handle the load balancing and dynamically spinning up and and spinning down. Uh, Systems like that exist, and they will marry with this nicely, but I don't have an example in that, that it is a project that you would have to do. This is meant to be you and a certain number of people you can think of. <laughs> no problem sharing. Beyond that, uh, if it's just widespread public, that's going to be a lot of computational cost. Somebody's going to have to pay for that. You're going to have to have a model of that <laughs> um, as a project. Yes? Um, I think that actually has, um, oh, where was, I had, maybe I closed it. Um, so I had a, a version showing that. Um, so the answer, oh, oh, here, so you can, there's a trivial, um, if you want something that's just tied to a particular, um, widget, you can drag that widget and it'll animate things over time. Um, in this case, it's gonna have to page back in after filling it with OpenStreetMap data. Um, but you, um, you can also, uh, when you have a particular object, um, give you an example, um, that has uh, sliders, uh, you can just tell it at the top, you tell it output equals um, uh, scrubber, and you'll get a little, um, uh, VCR style interface for playing and going back. So uh, I haven't really delved into it, but um, Holoview is, is built around the idea of having an enormous multi-dimensional data set of some sort and then doing something to get that in front of your eyeballs, whether that something is giving you widgets to explore it or laying it out over space or giving you a knob to choose between it. it you declare to Holoview all of your data and it will let you aggregate it down, slice it, whatever you feel like. It's very flexible in that, and having a that would be an entirely different talk <laughs> where I tried to do So Holoviews is one component of this talk, um, but it could easily be its own talk uh, saying, okay, I've got my data. Now, what are all the flexible, cool ways I can slice and dice it? Uh, to see that, go to holoviews.org or geoviews.org. Any other questions? Parquet? That's an uh, Apache format. It's a columnar format, so it's not as flexible in structure as HDF5. So HDF5, is the H is for hierarchical, and Parquet is not hierarchical. It's just for tidy data, tidy columnar data. 
it's meant for very, very large things. Uh, so parquet is, um, uh, there's parquet, feather, and arrow. These are three related Apache projects. They come from the Java world, not from Python world, but they've all made it into Python and Avro. Those are all Apache projects that are related to each other and are all about columnar data. Um, Arrow is about columnar data in memory and being able to share that between processors. Parquet is the on-disk version of that. Um, so it's, uh, anyway, w we did a, if you look at Data Shader's website, there's, a, there's an issue about benchmarking different file formats. And we benchmarked 12 different columnar file formats, and they all were bad. <laughs> except for uh, Parquet and one oh, no longer supported one called Vcalls. Uh, everything else had at least a factor of 10 worse performance. And so, okay, well we're going to use this one. <laughs> uh, it really matters a lot. Um, and for um, uh, our gridded multidimensional data sets, array, uh, X-Array has had as good a performance as anything we've seen, and it, that's based on NetCDF, which is based on HDF. Uh, I'm sure there are ways to do better, but not in the libraries we're able to get a hold of and, and do testing on. So uh, Holoview supports X-Ray and Iris uh, cubes for that purpose. Um, I, I don't, yeah, I can't think of anything else that's, uh, that's in the hierarchical sphere. Um, in the back there, I think. No, that was all uh, external. That was just a URL to some server somewhere in the world. It can be any URL to any, uh, any server. It's not, uh, we don't have the data. It's all remote. And, and so when you export this uh, stuff, you zoom in, you're going to get that data freshly arrived from that server, and it's all freshly explorable. And so that's one way you can um, export things without having to deal with this scaling thing, scaling issue, which is to just render an enormous thing tile it up, set up a tile server, set up more than one tile server, and do that. And that's all going to work. Just to, it's exactly as if you put a map on top of another map. If you have, uh, in fact, I have an example. Somebody doesn't, doesn't, has done that with data shader stuff. So they data shaded an enormous uh, image, topped it up, set up as a tile server, and it looks, it's just like the existing tile servers. So you can add to that number. And that's a, that's a very effective way to deploy things as long as you don't need much interactivity at the end. Because as long as you've captured it and don't want to change it, Sure, dice it up, serve it as tiles. Yeah. At the moment, all of this is CPU. It's all local here on this, uh, this CPUs here. Um, but uh, like I said, it, it, we'll su we support two data frames. Without very much work, we could add another. And there's a project in Anaconda to do a GPU data frame uh, funded by NVIDIA and MapD. And um, it's meant to present a data frame interface, but with all the data stored on the GPU. So um, as soon as that's ready, it's already mainly not buggy, is what I heard last week. Uh, as soon as it is quite not buggy, uh, we're ready to try it out and uh, attach that to data shader. Um, but that's only for the visualization portion. If you had a simulator in your workflow here, it would be a separate issue just to parallelize that or put that on the GPU or so on. And that's in a simulator-based workflow, that's likely to be your bottleneck rather than the visualization. So yes, we'll try it out. Uh, it may not solve that many problems, but we're, we'll do it. And that's, that's where the name data shader came from originally. It's from the idea of graphic shading, turning stuff into pixels. That's what it does. Probably. I think it's a little, uh, that'll be further behind the data shader probably, because data shader is a tiny code base. Easily retargeted, X-ray is more ambitious, um, and uh, and we don't control. We control both data shader and um, the GPU data frame within the same organization. We're down the hall. We know each other, so we can coordinate. Uh, whereas uh, X-ray is a distributed team of, not even a team, a distributed set of people <laughs> who talk to each other and arrange things on a slower time scale. So uh, yes, hopefully, because X-ray, as you may know, is built on Dask. It's built on Dask, um, Dask arrays, not Dask data frames, though. So the data frame is a, the columnar version of, a, of the Dask array, which is a much more general concept. So it's a little harder. It's going to be more work to do that. Yes?
I guess I should have mentioned that. So um, what I gave today was a microcosm uh, of the tutorial. We gave a JupyterCon. It's a four-hour tutorial um, that basically, uh, during that tutorial, the first 45 minutes of it was this talk. Um, and so I, I went quickly through showing everything just like I showed you. And then the rest, there's three hours of, OK, now everybody, open your laptops and do it step by step. And we're going to go through every little step in detail. And so that's all available. Um, the URL is I'm not up there anymore. Um, um, if you search for JupyterCon, GitHub, and my name, it'll probably show up. Um, but uh, we will send around a list of links anyway to these notebooks and things like that. So there's, there's this talk, which will be in there. So you can run through this talk exactly as it is. It's, it is a runnable notebook. But then you can also run through the 12 different notebooks that, that form in this tutorial. We're still coming, trying to come up with a name for this whole collection of hollow views, bokeh, and data shader to solve graphics problems, solve visualizations problems. Because there are three libraries that are all really tightly tied together to, to make things happen. So. And I'm happy to talk afterwards um, privately. And thank you for inviting me. Nice questions. <laughs>